Hello, ladies and gentlemen, Big Daddy Top Hat here. There is no doubt that by this point in history, that Street Fighter 2 is one of the most important and iconic video games ever made. Not only did this classic rejuvenate the arcade industry, but it introduced to us the versus fighting genre as we know it. The game included player versus player combat, a large selectable playable roster of characters, and deep fighting mechanics. But as the game's title suggests, the franchise's 1991 outing was obviously not the maiden entry in the series. In today's episode, we are going to travel back to 1987 to discuss the origins of the World Warrior Tournament and look at the lesser told tale of the very first Street Fighter game, a game that despite the popularity of Street Fighter 2, many people have not gone back to play it. In fact, on the rare occasions that the original Street Fighter game does get brought up by the mainstream, people do not usually have the nicest things to say about it, and many opinions held regarding the game are somewhat derogatory. What is highlighted less on the other hand is the steps forward that were taken that would not only pave the way for the Street Fighter 2 we all know and love, but the fighting game genre as a whole. So join me today as we look back at the release of this game, what it brought to the table, and whether or not it is as horrible as they all seem to say. This, ladies and gentlemen, is the story of the first ever Street Fighter game. Yeah! The date is May the 12th, 1987, and we find ourselves in the US city of Philadelphia, the home of the country's greatest boxer of all time, Rocky Balboa. Speaking of this now legendary athlete, Capcom would hire the Cambria Boxing Club, a building that was used for location shooting in the Rocky movies. The reason for this? To host an elaborate event to introduce a new arcade game to distributors. According to Polygon.com, this was a staged exhibition that included local boxers, kickboxers and even a ring gale to entertain the rowdy crowd. This interesting spectacle, which featured 12 rounds of fights, was hosted by Bill Cravens, Capcom's Vice President of Sales and Marketing, who already had a great reputation for his charisma and sales skills. Portraying the role of a tuxedo-wearing ring announcer for the event, industry trade magazine Replay reported that after the fights took place, he would walk over to an object that was covered over using brown butcher's paper, with him tearing it off to reveal Street Fighter to the world for the first time. Capcom would envision this game as an important step for the company's direction, which we'll soon begin discussing more on and why. But first, let's look even further back into this game's development cycle. This brings us over to Japan to a man known as Takashi Nishiyama, with amusingly the concept for one of the most important video game franchises of all time being born from nothing but sheer boredom. To quote the man with regards to coming up with the idea, he states, I actually remember it very clearly even now. One day at Capcom, we had a meeting between the development staff and the sales team, and this particular meeting happened to run very long. I think it was about two hours. Personally, as someone on the development side, I found it very hard to stay interested during these meetings, so I tended to daydream and think about games. And I remember not really paying attention and jotting down some ideas on paper. Then, there was just this one moment where the idea for Street Fighter popped into my head and I drew it out on a piece of paper during the meeting. I was sitting next to Capcom producer Yoshiki Okamoto and I asked him what he thought about it and he said it looked very interesting. In his Polygon interview, Nishiyama goes on to outline that, in a more concrete sense, the game was inspired by his work on Spartan X over at IREM previously, a game we know in the West as Kung Fu Masters in the arcades and Kung Fu on the NES, a game that can be argued to be the first ever side-scrolling beat-em-up. Even more specifically in relation to this game, Nishiyama was thinking of the boss fights, which involved strategically avoiding enemy attacks while hacking away at these tougher opponents' life bars, with the idea being to build a whole game around these more elaborate fights. Which begs the question, if we consider Kung Fu's heritage, can we think of it as Street Fighter Zero? I'll leave that one for you to ponder in the comments section. Nishiyama would build on this idea and eventually get the green light from Capcom higher-ups to make his concept into a game, but this story would be impossible to cover without mentioning another man, Hiroshi Matsumoto. 
Nishiyama would show his design document to Matsumoto, who would not only aid him in refining his ideas, but would end up, according to Nishiyama, doing everything else as the game's planner. The humble Nishiyama states that while he oversaw everything, it was really Matsumoto's game. With regards to this game, Matsumoto comments, I thought about what kinds of characters we should have, what kinds of moves they should have, what kinds of fighting styles they should have. At the time, I was very interested in martial arts, and, just as a hobby, I had studied and read up on them extensively, so I was excited. Nishiyama believes that the 1987 Street Fighter game differed massively from other games that involved fighting that was already on the market. In that while there were many games that included fighting, most were types of sports games like boxing or martial arts, and if they differed from the norm, they would still usually only include one fighting style. Street Fighter was different in not only that it had story and character elements, but it also combined many different fighting styles into one game. The likes of boxers and karate experts were facing off in video game form, a staple for most versus fighting games to come. Nishiyama also notes another hugely unique factor about the game was how it controlled. The mechanics would end up setting up the entire competitive fighting genre as we now know it. But what is most interesting about this of all is that upon further inspection, it appears that the way the game controls evolved from a series of corporate decisions rather than simply creative ones, which we shall talk about now. Basically, from Capcom as a company's point of view, Street Fighter was a huge elaborate experiment to help them carve out larger profits from the arcade market, in that the game would be played on very expensive arcade cabinets that would cost arcade operators twice as much as more traditional cabs. In order to produce these, Capcom would team up with Atari, with the hope that a more flashy machine would generate extra attention from arcade goers. This was a business strategy that Capcom had adopted from studying Sega and Namco's arcade successes, with Capcom previously just specialising in printing circuit boards that could be plugged into other machines. While in many ways Capcom were not equipped to compete with Sega or Namco on many fronts, they conceptualised a unique way to make their cabs stand out. This would be with the introduction of machines featuring pressure sensitive pneumatic buttons, a feature that would be tied directly into the way Street Fighter would be designed. The cabinet with its two pressure sensitive buttons would allow the characters in the game to punch and kick at varying strength levels, depending on how hard players would press the buttons. Thus meaning that gamers could perform these basic moves at low, medium and high strengths depending on their taps. As you can now see, these varying strength attacks were arguably invented merely to push a control gimmick, much like with games you get on the DS that require the use of a stylus, or motion controls on the Wii for the sake of motion controls. It is really interesting to see that one of the most recurring elements of fighting games evolved from nothing more than pushing a gimmicky control scheme to grab consumers' attentions. Still, although the basic attacks could produce moves at different strengths, only two buttons brought its limitations. This would lead to Nishiyama and Matsumoto innovatively allowing for other moves to be performed by combining taps with joystick motions, another important building block that would contribute to the foundations of versus fighters. As Capcom began their attempt to move into the high-end arcade market, their innovative yet gimmicky game would be manufactured in the form of crescent-shaped deluxe upright cabinets, with the pressure-sensitive controls helping separate their experience from the competition. But it would quickly transpire that there was a huge problem. To put it simply, playing Street Fighter with its pressure-sensitive technology was a lot more tiring than sweaty arcade users expected and, after repeat play, the experience reportedly could even end up being a physically painful one. Nishiyama states regarding this, We realised that it was very tiring to hit the sensor over and over. It was basically like exercising. The whole point of monetising this business was to get people to become repeat customers, where they would put in 100 yen coins over and over again so we could make money. And when you're getting tired from playing the game, that's not going to happen. Todd Cravens, the son of the now legendary Bill Cravens, who we mentioned at the start of the video, recalls playing on these cabinets himself. 
He recalls, you had to be the hell out of it. I remember playing it for the first time and being absolutely exhausted. Everyone was kind of like, oh my goodness, it's going to be hard to get the second and third quarter on this. They were doing a big unveiling of this at a gym in Philadelphia for the US distributors and they had boxers there who played the game. And even those guys were tired afterwards. So while the arcade cabinets with pressure sensitive buttons were a great idea in theory, in reality it was just not a very practical one. So some sort of change would be required to save the game. The decision would be made to ditch the pressure sensitive feature and retool the game to run with arcade cabinets that featured control panels with a six button control layout. This would mean the different strength levels of punches and kicks would all be able to be mapped to a different button each. While this idea sounds simple on paper, Capcom's sales department despised the idea and Nishiyama would be faced with a lot of pushback from those who did not want this to happen. They believed that consumers would never play games that featured as many as six different buttons and the level of complexity would put most people off of even trying it. Despite a lot of resistance, Nishiyama would be able to test market the game with the six button layout, with consumer feedback being largely positive. This would be enough to convince the company's sales staff that they had been wrong and judging by how future events would transpire when it came to fighting games, this simple change that was made out of necessity would set the wheels in motion for everything that would be to come from the genre. So thus far we have established that this game introduced the concept of pitting fighters of different disciplines against one another in a one on one competition along with the legendary six button control scheme. But obviously this would also be the title that would establish some of the franchise's now iconic characters and lore. So let's get to talking about that. In Street Fighter's maiden outing, players take control of the emblematic martial artist known as Ryu as he competes in the first ever World Warrior Tournament to prove his strength to all. In fact, player 2 can take control of his sparring partner and rival Ken, who can jump into the tournament unqualified at any time to defeat Ryu and steal his place in the competition. While only Ryu and Ken are playable in this one, what is of note is that the game's planner, Matsumoto, recalls that the original plan was to have lots of playable characters, like in Street Fighter 2 later, but this feature had to sadly be cut due to time constraints. The difference between Ryu and Ken in the game is merely aesthetic, with the pairing sharing the same basic moves and special techniques, including the original use of the Hadouken. Takashi Nishiyama, the creator of the original Street Fighter, credits the 1970s era anime Space Battleship Yamato, in which a battleship has a laser-like weapon. However, looking at the way the move is performed, it also looks to be inspired by the Kamehameha from the Dragon Ball series, which was created three years earlier in 1984. Throughout the tournament, the player must defeat eight different computer-controlled opponents, some of which have now fallen into obscurity. Others, though, have made lots of recurring appearances and have become huge parts of Street Fighter's deep lore. On the more obscure character side, we have an expelled Kempo instructor known as Retsu, a ninja named Geki, an underground full contact karate champion known as Joe, Lee, an expert in Chinese boxing, and a former heavyweight boxing champion who killed an opponent in the ring known as Mike. Speaking of this character, since people mention him a fair amount in my comment section, I thought it is worth mentioning that Capcom have clarified in the past that this boxer and Balrog from Street Fighter 2 are not the same person, with many fans speculating that they are the same fighter due to Balrog being known as M. Bison in Japan, but Capcom have squashed that theory. Further to this, we would get characters debut who would later return in the Street Fighter Alpha series. These would include the large punk who combines wrestling and boxing known as Birdie, the well-dressed Cali stick wielding Englishman known as Eagle, the elderly assassin Jen, and Saget's Muay Thai student known as Aiden. The final encounter in the game is against none other than the Emperor of Muay Thai himself, the eyepatch wearing master of the tiger uppercut, Sagat, who Ryu squares off against at the end of the game in a match that sets the wheels in motion for the rest of the entire Street Fighter story canon. I hope you can tell from everything that has been presented in this video today, this 1987 video game would be the source of many elements that would be reused for future Street Fighter installments. But if this is the case, what other title shortfalls that prevent it from being as well loved as its more famous sequel? 
Well, truth be told, with its innovations that it brought to the table, Street Fighter was warmly received. And while only 1,000 units were shifted with the original pressure-sensitive cabinets, estimates vary that the revised machines with six-button layouts sold between 10 and 50,000 units. As noted by many modern gamers though, this title is just not simply as fun to play now as what we'd see released in 1991 and beyond, with criticism often being drawn from the character's awkward movements, special moves that require extreme amounts of precision, and a lack of overall grace compared to later legendary installments. Nishiyama and Matsumoto have since gone on to highlight some of the difficult challenges that the pairing would face when developing the game, including the making of a game specifically to be built to sell a gimmicky arcade cabinet, rather than just trying to program a traditionally good game. Matsumoto also brings up that the main programmer that Capcom provided them with to make the game was not even a game programmer, but instead had previously only ever worked as a system engineer so he and other employees would need to teach him how to make the game on the job. Matsumoto states no matter how hard they often tried to explain things they wanted in the game to him, he simply didn't understand many basic concepts. This would mean that Matsumoto would draw on his own limited game programming experience he had gained from working on Legendary Wings, and do a lot of the work himself, as it was faster than teaching someone from scratch. The end experience that was delivered can feel horribly slow to play at times, and paired with the stiff controls and shoddy animation, it is no wonder that gamers are less likely to revisit this entry than others in the series. To put it simply, while this game can at points feel horrible to play today, some of the ideas that the game included were some of the greatest that have ever been conceived in gaming. It was just the execution of the ideas themselves that didn't quite live up to Nishiyama and Matsumoto's expectations. Ironically, it ended up being the game's six-button control layout that seemed to receive the most critical praise, with the six-button units possibly outselling the pressure button units as many as 50 to 1. This would make Capcom keen to make a sequel to the game, but a sequel would end up being put into doubt when both Nishiyama and Matsumoto would leave the company after being headhunted by competitors SNK. Nishiyama has since even gone on to explain why he would leave Capcom in favour of the competition, admitting, This is honestly very, very hard to talk about. But to explain why I ended up leaving Capcom? It's because I didn't get along with my boss at the time, and I had hit a point where I was wondering if I could continue to stay at the company, despite such a situation. It just so happened that at the time, SNK ended up asking me to join them. So I got the offer and I ended up going there. But there were people that I had worked closely with at Capcom at the time, including Matsumoto. So I ended up basically taking a bunch of them with me. And now with SNK, Nishiyama would set out to build and improve on what they had created working for Capcom, eventually having a spiritual sequel to the game finished by 1991. The title featuring Street Fighters facing off street fighting in South Town was a game we now know as, as Fatal Fury, which would carve out its own niche in fighting game history, even introducing the legendary Terry Bogard to the world a fighting game character who many consider to have the greatest character design of all time. But as we know that year, Capcom would also have a Street Fighter sequel up their sleeve of their own, the groundbreaking Street Fighter 2 The World Warrior, the video game that would innovate the genre further and propel the whole fighting game genre into the mainstream. Still. This would not be the end of Nishiyama's involvement with Street Fighter, as after playing a significant role in developing the King of Fighters series for SNK, in 2001 Nishiyama would form his very own development studio, known as Dimps, who by 2008 would be commissioned by Capcom to help develop Street Fighter 4, meaning that Nishiyama's legacy and impact in the world of fighting games stems way past the pioneering yet flawed 1987 game. So, in conclusion to this video, next time you see someone bring up the 1987 Street Fighter game, do not be so quick to bury its flaws, and instead try to remember all of the different revolutionary features it introduced to gaming. The game is far more significant than being just a prequel to one of the greatest video games ever made, even though many people think it plays a bit horribly. 
So ladies and gentlemen, that was the story of 1987 Street Fighter. If you enjoyed this video and want to learn more about fighting game history, I have made a plethora of videos covering a cornucopia of different fighting games, and even dozens looking at different Street Fighter characters, lore and design concepts. If you are new here, please do not forget to like this video, leave a comment telling me what you think of the first Street Fighter game, and hitting that subscriber button and notification bell to ensure you see all of my future uploads. I even have a very exciting video coming up soon, which I have been working on directly with some key figures from the Street Fighter team from the early 90s, so be sure to subscribe if you want some never heard before information revealed next week. Videos like this are in part made possible by the generous people who back what I do over on Patreon, aiding me on being able to work on content like this on a full-time basis. I try my best to provide you all with early access to my work as quickly as I can and as often as I can. So huge thank yous go out to the following people. A Murder of Crows, Carl Johnson, Heo Paula Lopez, Nostalgia Collector, Ben Haradine, Corey Armas Sr., Ron Dinch, Evan Border, Philip Manth, Azure Arkai, Jotkin Varela, Michael Cullix, Ego, Jordan Durant, Ian Boyle, Nick Daniels, Princess Zana, Daniel Daly, Computer Man, House of a Ted, Gary Pinkett, ECU Professor, Johnny Holly, August Piazza, Justin Wang, Capcom vs. SNK, Hermes Gonzalez, Man Shovel, Michael Hall, Sang Hee, Norma Stitz, Langston Miller, Noob, Sarah Powell, Blame It Renee, Marino Liga, TOG Driver, Louis Vian, John Bates, David Bow, Chris Fisk, Rick67, Antonio Rodriguez, Craig Jenkins, Synth Spaces, Punk Toast, and everybody else who is kind enough to back my work over on the Patreon platform. It is very much appreciated. Thank you very much.